Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit Photo, episode number 65, with Catherine Hall and Leo Laporte, recorded on July 10th, 2012. Landscape photographer Michael Fry. Twit Photo is brought to you by Audible.com. To download the free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash twitphoto. It's time for Twit Photo, the show that covers the art and science of photography and how you can be a better photographer with our host, Catherine Hall. Good to see you, Catherine. CatherineHall.net is the website. And uh, we should say, uh, we have a couple of announcements. First of all, and I know people know this by now, but I'll, I'm sad to say, reiterate the fact that we've got two more Twit photos, this one and the next one. Yes, two more. And, uh, but and then I was you're so taking... excited I couldn't sleep last night. For You've got days. a good idea. Yes, I do. Tell us about your good idea. Well, I have to say, one of the most saddening aspects of Twit Photo ending was just losing contact with the community. And there was such a reach out with everyone on Twitter and Google Plus and email. People love this show. And I, I love this show. I love doing this show. And I didn't want it to end. So I'm, I'm, ta I'm moving on, Leo. Yeah. I'm moving on. Yeah. So if you want to pull up my blog, there is a little announcement there. CatherineHall.net slash blog. Uh, we're going to have to get you to do that uh, there, Brian, because I don't have the, uh, I can't broadcast anything. Roger that. But anyway, there's, it just explains sort of my, my, transition and my thought process and everything but I'm incredibly excited to announce that I'm going to be doing my own show photography unfiltered is that what you're gonna That's call what it it's called I love it yeah I so love it we're gonna do it on Tuesdays to keep it somewhat consistent I'm not sure the timing yet um, but now I suggested to Catherine oh, yeah, keep it, that she not do, not it, do it live yes because that baby adds steps. a lot of yeah baby steps sometime at some point I'm sure you'll get to live and you could have a hangout going or something like that while you're doing it yeah I mean, that's, live that's my really biggest, adds to the complexity my biggest concern is obviously losing Leo no you don't need me <laughs> I lost you not you losing me um, but then also just the quality that I have become accustomed to so there will be a little bit of a growing pain with that but well, the good news that, is the content's going to be great. And um, one of the best things throughout this process is I really got a lot of feedback from viewers. Oh, yeah, you could go to photo photography unfiltered.com. You can the see site. the site. Yeah. Um, I got a lot of feedback from viewers, and I, the show is going to evolve and change in a way that's satisfying the viewers out there. So that's the I'm way to do it. I'm excited to do that. It's all about the community. Um, it's definitely gonna be a lot more community driven and a lot more how to's in bringing Ryan in who's going to be co-hosting with me oh good yeah so great a lot more sort of he's a gear gadget tech guy so satisfying that part of the audience as well so I was very much hoping that you would do that and I'm really glad and we'll be glad to help you in any way and certainly we'll point people but yeah to Brian it. if you hit the home page you can kind of see the mission statement and and all of it so photography unfiltered. Now we got one more show next week, and then yes, uh, we do. And then this show's going to be rolling out in August. In August, we'll start, yes. and we'll make sure everybody knows about and it. And I'm jumping on it. Good. I'm doing the best I can, good, trying good, to good. make sure there's no um, delay. And yes, Ryan is Twit's very own gaffer. Yeah, Ryan Tavern, Marsh. You're lucky because your your boyfriend happens to be a very good production guy. There he is, and he's besides a hell of a good-looking fella. <laughs> he, of course, he's a very good production guy, and so he's gonna. It'll be great to have him both as yeah, a host. Yeah, and he and, loves teaching too. Yeah, so. he's good. So yeah. that's great. I'm excited. Yeah, so he's look much better to than it. me. Much better. Look forward than me. to it. No, yeah. no. But I'm I'll glad you're going to do that. I think that's great. Now let's talk about our guest because I am very excited because one of my favorite places in the world, we're not so far away, is Yosemite Valley, the national park. Yes. It is totally gorgeous, and our guest today spends his time photographing it. In fact, lives just outside of Yosemite. Yes, he does. Let's welcome uh, Michael. Michael, thank you so much. Pry, you. Been, People have been asking for you. Great. And so it's a great honor to have you here. Well, it's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, good to so have you. So what, I, I, you came to Yosemite when you were 25 years old, and here we are. Yeah. It looks like you're a little um, older. Yeah. <laughs> Tell yeah. me about your, how did this all come to be? How did you end up 
doing photography, mainly focusing on landscapes in Yosemite? Um, well, I, I actually got a job in Yosemite um, back in the early 80s. And um, at that time, I was probably more interested in rock climbing than, than mm -hmm. photography. And, you know, when hiking and rock climbing and all that kind of stuff. But uh, after having spent a few years there, years, years there, I got more and more into photography. So the two really kind of went together. And I think my, you know, my interest in nature and photography grew together. You know, I was interested in nature, so uh, I wanted to show what I was seeing, the beautiful things I was seeing out there. And, and so that really got me more interested in it. And um, I got a job, uh, after a couple of years in the park, uh, I got a job at the Ansel Adams Gallery, working as one of their staff photographers. And, and that was a, a great education for me. So um, just meeting lots of great photographers and looking at, at lots of wonderful photographs by Ansel and other people as well. And uh, it does have to be a little intimidating because you're following in the footsteps yeah. of some of the greatest yeah. American photographers. Yeah, the most, I would say he's probably the most well known sure. photographer Ansel Adams, yeah. Yeah. in history. I, I, I would, uh, in this country at least, for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and you know, at, at first that was intimidating, I think, and maybe that's one of the reasons why when I first started out and, and doing photography seriously and started selling photographs, I was mostly doing wildlife. I was very into animals and doing wildlife. You're not going to do half dome yeah, you know, I right thought, away. Well, I'll, I'll do some other things. <laughs> um, but as time went on, uh, I gravitated more to doing landscapes and, and I really didn't worry about that anymore. I mean, I, I was just doing my own thing, still am, and not worried about whether you know, someone else has photographed that scene right. before or whatever, you know, I just, just try to do what, what pleases me. What is it about Yosemite that draws you? Oh my God, I mean, well, it's just such a beautiful place. Um, you know, I lived right in Yosemite Valley for over 20 years and so uh, got this really sort of intimate acquaintance with it and all the changes and seasons. And uh, so I really, I really love the place. It's, it's you know, it's my home, I think, right. at this point. And, um, so, you know, I think I think anyone who's been there understands oh, yeah. the the appeal. It's gorgeous of the place. But you have another, you, as you say, you have an advantage because you're there all the time. You're yeah, around. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You yeah. know, that it, it part of a you know, big part of landscape photography is being in the right place at the right time. You know, there, there's an element of luck, and it just helps to be in close proximity to the place. I mean, when I was living right in the valley, I live about an hour away right now. But when I was living in the valley, I could you know, look out my window and go, well, you know, the clouds look kind of interesting. Maybe I'll go out and see what's happening. So that was great. But. So is there a time that there is actually a downtime in Yosemite where it's, there's less traffic? Or is it always less pretty traffic. much, yeah. you know, like, I mean, it's um, such a tourist, yeah. tourist attraction. Well, winter time. Yeah. You know, how, how do you avoid... But there's still the Bracebridge Dinner and there's the yeah. Wawona Lodge where yeah. people go in the snow. And yeah. I mean, it is a year-round park in it many is, ways. It is, but it, it's much less crowded in yeah. the wintertime. Yeah, the summer is when it's... Yeah, summer. and and winter is probably my favorite season to photograph yeah. because there's more interesting weather, more storms, right. snow. Um, you know, clearing storms are the best. You know, if you're in Yosemite Valley, uh, if you can catch it when a storm's clearing and there's mist rising along the cliffs, mm. that's perfect. Look at, um, like this. Like it's that. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we... We, uh, those of us who are in Yosemite, we just, we hope for days like that. And they don't come that often, but once in a while. Once in a while you get something like that. So, I mean, if someone was planning, they wanted to come to Yosemite and they wanted mm. to explore and photograph mm. this incredibly beautiful place, mm. winter's a good time to come. But how long should they, I mean, the winter is obviously a little bit risky, being that it might be socked in the whole right. time. Or yeah. You, I, what, how long should someone plan their trip? Well... Uh, long enough. Um, you know, if you if you plan on coming in winter for one or two days, yeah, it could be raining or snowing the whole time. So I would try to plan, you know, a week or at least five days so you have a good chance of, of getting some interesting weather during that time. If you're a photographer, you know, that's what you're looking for. Um, and even the same thing in spring and fall. I mean, the longer you can spend, the better. Um, I, I can't believe sometimes that there are people who come in and they, you know, their first visit to the park and, and they have like two hours, you know, and, and that's, that's just, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, so the longer the better. And, and, you know, it helps to do a little bit of advanced planning and research about some of the places you might want to photograph, you know, with the, the book that you mentioned. And, and 
um, other resources, just looking for, at other people's photos on Flickr or whatever can give you some great ideas about where are some of the best spots to go. Well, we should mention, so you have a Yosemite uh, photo guide. It's an iPad and iPhone app, $4.99 uh, on the store. Let me, uh, due to size limitations, okay. But when you connect, you get bigger uh, quality images. So this is, uh, this is uh, on the uh, iPad. And then this is coming out soon, which is great. Yeah, that's, that's the, the, uh, the second edition of the Photographer's Guide to Yosemite. So it's all been revised and updated, uh, new locations, um, new information about you know, all the locations. Because I've learned a lot since the book first came out about you know, when, when and where the best light is and the best photo opportunities are. That's what's nice about this app. You've got sunrise, sunset times, you've got maps, you've mm -hmm. got tips, mm -hmm. places to go. You have one of the, you know, in the book you have the locations, uh, but here also on the app too, the, and the best month to take a photograph, say, of Horsetail Falls, Right. It's February in the evening. If, yeah, for four ninety nine, that's kind of an. That's no great. Five to thirty <laughs> minutes before sunset, especially around February sixteenth to twenty third. You couldn't that, get more specific that, that than that. I know. Precise. I've um, a, a friend and I kind of had a debate about okay, when when is really the best time to photograph Horsetail Falls? So I've <laughs> I've I've kind of taken it taken it on as a science project to figure out okay, what's what's the best time? That's my current and that's your best scientific estimate. estimate. You know, so so yeah. the, for four ninety nine, if you're going to Yosemite. You get this app on your iPhone. I mean, that's or a gold mine. For sure. That's yeah. a gold mine. So in this in this book, mm. top three, I'm putting on the spot. Top three places in Yosemite. If you're going, you must photograph. Well, um, number one on the list has to be tunnel view. I mean, that's the classic Yosemite view. We just saw we just saw yeah. that actually. And, yeah. and yeah. the the thing about tunnel view is though that it takes just the right conditions. On a clear sunny day, it it just, I mean, it's impressive visually standing there if you've never been there before, but as a photograph, it just doesn't work. So That always happens to need, me. I see yeah. these beautiful things in my head, <laughs> yeah. and the picture, it's like, well, that was yeah, nice. But you, you were looking for dramatic light, this yeah. shift. Look at yeah, that. that. That's gorgeous. That's a, that's a tunnel view photograph. Gorgeous. And, and, you know, one of those, another one of those instances when I was lucky enough to be there when, when storm is clearing and there's that great mist and all yeah. that. So, you know, with the right light and clouds, it can be spectacular, and, and that would be, you know, that's got to be someplace you at least want to see and take a snapshot of. And if you get lucky, then you'll get some great light. Right. Well, as far as mist is concerned, any tips on capturing mist? Besides using um, a zoom lens, I'm sure that's probably well, some, one of them. Sometimes. Um, be quick because it changes fast. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, be prepared. You know, be prepared to wait too. You know, you could be you could be standing at tunnel view, and it could be just completely socked in. You know, you can't see a hundred feet in front of you, and then that'll break. I mean, and the moment when that breaks, that could be spectacular. So, so you have to have some patience too. So. And then yeah. wait, patience, waiting. That's that's what photography is, right? With yeah, how average, on average, how often? I mean, what's the ballpark figure? How long are you waiting for these? shots um i mean i'm i'm not mm. waiting What's around like all day all day long but i might wait at a place like tunnel view for a couple hours if i think if i think the conditions are, are promising for a shot like so. this did you go there and say ah i am i know this will look great no you didn't no <laughs> i'll come back when <laughs> well, the sun is setting or well it was, sun, it was sunrise but sun well I, I this was this was fairly spontaneous it's um a gorgeous you know shot just with the just mist. i thought oh i should go over there that could be a good spot <laughs> and it turned out to be so that's another thing good photographers do they get up early yeah yeah i'm i'm yeah. i guess i'm a bad photographer i know <laughs> I, I hate getting up early I, yeah. i'm i'm a night owl actually so but so if for you know a landscape you're get photographer this, uh, oh. you know that's that's not a good combination but oh. i i force myself to get up sometimes so but um, when you're going earlier you're getting up in dark so you're there mm, when it's yeah. when it's rising yeah, yeah, it, you usually have to be where you want to be before the sun's coming up. This is another classic shot, Bridal Veil Falls. Everybody mm -hmm. shoots that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gorgeous, yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. But yeah, that's from Tunnel View, and um, which, you know, one of, the, one of the amazing things about that viewpoint is that there's this waterfall that seems to come out of nowhere. Right. Yeah. Um, that, that makes it. And I love it, you got the light hitting it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was... That was, you know, again, just one of those uh, lucky, special moments that that sometimes you get, you know. But um, luck, y you have more luck the more time you spend out there. Are these so. all tripod shots, or do you do handheld too? Or? Um, almost all tripod. Once in a while, I'll handhold something. 
so but but almost always on the tripod so you have your tripod I do have my tripod. maybe you could walk us through for landscape photographers what what should they be looking for in a tripod purchase? Okay, great purpose? Um, well I think purchase. let me uh, make sure my wire doesn't get caught here um, you're gonna be headless if you're standing. <laughs> yeah, just move <laughs> it over. And, okay. Move it over in front of you and sit back down, and then we'll get a, sh we'll right. get a better well, shot. Uh, that I way. can sit for the first part of this. Okay. Here, sir. We can so get a camera on you, you later. want you want a tripod that uh, you know, one of the things that I look for is I want it to be able to go low and I want it to be able to go high. Okay. So you'll notice that this. Let's see if we can see that there. That this doesn't have a center post. Which means that I can spread the legs out oh. and get it. Oh, so you can get it pretty much ground level. Flat on the ground. Mine has uh, a center post. Mine has a center post. Yep. I thought okay. I had the same one. Well, you know, there there are certainly advantages to center posts. It's easy to uh, get so a get a the, level shot because I can. This is yeah. the Gitzo 1325 for people yeah. that are curious. Yeah. Catherine it's, and I, it's I both have this tripod. tripod. Yeah. We love yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Um, and of course, you want it to be able to go up high. Let's see if we can get that. Great. Oh, um, nice. And the Gitzo has nice quick release, which is uh, yeah, one of the yeah, reasons people love release, it. Yeah. You know, a quick release. You've got to have a quick release, otherwise it's just a pain to get the camera <laughs> off and on. Yeah. But I also think that you know some of the kind of cheap quick releases are a real source of problems. Because you know, they cause rattle. They, cause, yeah, yeah cause they they can get loose yeah. and then the the camera twists yeah. and or if you have it tilted vertically, it'll it'll you know sag it's downward sag and down. so forth. So um, so I'm going to put this up. Look how I actually, high this goes. Holy yeah, cow. I actually don't have this quite all the way up as high as it'll go almost but you can see that it goes to my eye level oh yeah uh, without the center post so so I want it to be able to go low and I want it to be able to go high and you know a lot of people have tripods that aren't high enough right and they end up you know bending over like this <laughs> to look through the viewfinder which makes it impossible to get a straight horizon you know if you're looking at the camera sideways you can't you can't get the horizon straight um, also it's bad for your back so uh, so you want something that's going to go high, and I want something that's going to go low too. And and without the center post is ideal. Um, you know, you mentioned the quick release. You want something that's not going to twist. You know, I think most uh, most pros that I know have ball heads like this. This is kind of an ancient one, an Arca Swiss one that's 20 years old, I think, but it still works well. Um, I think though that maybe my next head is going to be a, a geared head. Um, I've had a couple of workshop students who have the Bogan geared head, and um, it works really well for landscapes. It's not as quick, you know, so it doesn't work for wildlife or sports or things like that. But um, but for you know for landscapes, it allows you to just turn a knob to really fine tune the composition, where you can you know just straighten it slightly or go slightly down or left or right. Um, so so that might be my next. Uh, tripod head so people so, typically will buy a tripod separately from the head then well when you get when you get the you know more advanced expensive models they are of yeah. course you want the tripod to be sturdy you yeah. know that's that's I, I think a fairly obvious one uh, carbon fiber is a great choice for you know lightweight yet sturdy and of course you know you pay for that but it's worth it um, there are Gitzo knockoffs that are a lot less expensive yeah. that are pretty good yeah there are some there are some good things out yeah. there yeah um, my my friend Mike Osborne likes to say that people could save themselves a lot of money if they just bought a good tripod to begin with. You know, most people right. buy a cheap flimsy exactly one. That's exactly what yeah. I did. Right. I've gone through well, four cheap tripods right. and I finally yeah, said I'm right. buying exactly. a good so. You know, you, yeah. you, you do that and then you finally buy a good one and, you know, in the long run you could just save yourself some money if you just <laughs> got a good one to start with. If so. I had. So. I mean, how long have you had that one for? They last, um, they last I've a long I've had this time. one maybe... If you, Six don't, years if you don't leave yeah. them in Norway, they last a really yeah, long exactly. time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not the disposable. Okay, so now I'm going to ask the obvious question. Mm. So obviously in a lot of these situations, there is plenty of light. Mm. So why the necessary? Great question. A um, couple of things. I think, first of all, having the camera on a tripod allows you to, to do some things you couldn't otherwise do. You know, one of those is, for example, to use slow shutter speed to, to let the water blur and yet have everything else in the picture sharp. You, know, you can't do that without a tripod. Um, also to get more depth of field, to get everything in focus. You know, Here's maybe, a perfect example, yeah. Maybe yeah. you have to stop down to you know, F16 or F22 to get a lot of depth of field, to get everything in focus. And that you may necessitate having it. a slow shutter speed. Right. So with the tripod, you don't have to worry about that. Right. Right. And also, I think, allows you to, to really 
sort of study your composition, you know, rather than just, oh, you know, that looks about right, but just, you know, take some time to look through the viewfinder and see, is this exactly what I want? So, yeah, that's yeah. actually one of my favorite things of tripods. Yeah. It just slows you down. Right. Yeah, exactly. Which is fine for landscapes, because it ain't going yeah, anywhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, you know, yes and or no. Or maybe. Some, the sometimes mist the is light's changing the really light's quick, changing and, and you have to react. Um, but there are uh, a lot of situations where you can take your time. Right. So light is huge for you. And you've, well, of course, yeah. on many occasions, mentioned that that's your, your medium, if you will. Yeah. Um, so yeah. explain to me how, how the study of light and documentation of light has affected your work. Um, boy, well, you know, light is... Is photography. You know, light is the medium that we're using. You know, we're not photographing things, we're photographing the light reflected off of objects. And you can have a great subject, but if the light's not good, it's probably not going to make a good photograph. On the other hand, you can have an ordinary subject, and if the light's good, or at least the light fits it, it could make a great photograph. So, so light's really everything. Um, and um, somewhere, uh, I remember reading a, 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 a Cole Weston quote, something about, you know, if you, if you don't understand light, you may as well forget about it. Um, you know, and I think that's, it is that's writing really with light, after all. Yeah, it's a yeah photo, that's, that's really means, what it's all about. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so light is obviously really crucial. And I think light... Um, can convey mood and feeling, which is really, you know, that's really primarily what I'm after. You know, I'm, I mean, I would love to just make a photograph that looks beautiful, but even more a photograph that captures a feeling or a mood that conveys what it felt like to be there. I think, I think ultimately, ultimately that's sort of what we're all after. You know, we'd like to make photographs that really communicate something besides what something looked like. So. I think that's the difference between an artistic an, an artistic photograph versus like a postcard shot. I remember yeah, when I was first absolutely. getting started, yeah. people would say, "Oh, your your photographs look like postcards." I'm like, that's "Oh, kind of that's like the worst insult." insult. Isn't it? Yeah. And I thought it was a compliment, and and it, it is. It's that difference between kind of taking it at face value and going beyond that, and yeah. really inducing, creating a mood, and, and right. creating a reaction from people so they feel like they're there and they can feel it. Yeah. Um, I think, you know what you just said, if you don't understand light, forget about it. Um, I think that could be somewhat discouraging for some people because you don't always know. I mean, for me, with photography, I did not understand light in the beginning. And I understood expression and composition and color and all those things, but light was really hard for me. Hmm. And it took me really having to push myself and using light modifiers like reflectors mm -hmm. and all these things to sort of understand the difference mm -hmm. that it can make. Um, did you always understand light? And how did you learn the language? Um, boy, great question. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know how I learned it other than just trying it, you know, trial and error. And um, I think, you know, I wish there had been some some tutorial out there that told me exactly, you know, what to look for. I mean, certainly there there are books, and I, I write about it in, in in some of my books and things about you know what to look for. Um, but but mainly just you know experience and, and trial and error the way I think. Everyone learns it, uh, honestly. Um, you know, I can give people you know, a few basics. You know, like it really, really, it's not that the light has to always be extraordinary. I mean, if it is, great. You know, you have a great opportunity for a photograph. But sometimes, kind of ordinary light, like just overcast light, can work very well. It just has to match the subject. So that's really what you're trying to do. You're trying to match the light to the subject. And if you're talking about nature photography, where you usually don't have any control over the light, you just have to try to put yourself in the right place at the right time. Either decide, you know, this is the the photograph that I want. What would be the best time to, to come back and get the, the light that would complement it? Or you can say, this is the light I've got today. You know, let's say it's overcast. What might work with that? And you can go from there. So. Um, so speaking of that, you know, overcast, soft light usually works great for colorful subjects, color contrast. Um, and same with front light, really, where the, the light's at your back, and so the, the sun's hitting the front of the subjects you're looking at. So it's pretty even lighting. Both of those situations, the lighting's even, and that helps to bring out colors and color contrast. Um, side light is great for texture. 
um, sand dunes, rocks, uh, tree bark, anything that's textured. Backlight, um, it's more difficult to work with in some ways, but it's rewarding if you do because uh, you can get you know, translucent light shining through things from behind and great silhouettes and shapes with it. So they're very, you know, real quick sort of uh, ideas about uh, some, of the, some of the ways to match light and subject. Do you gravitate towards one? Where's the light, where's the sun usually when you're shooting? <laughs> well, for smaller scenes, it's often in the shade. Um, for, you know, for bigger landscapes, you usually need to have some sun somewhere. And there it really could be anything. It could be front light, side light, back light. But um, it has to have some contrast. You know, without contrast, the photograph is flat and boring. You know, so you need to have some contrast. So you need to have some light and shade, some, some sort of juxtaposition of light and dark. Some depth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seems like you have a real advantage by, and maybe this is something we can all learn a little bit from, finding a subject, Yosemite, and, and learning by trying different things over and over again. You know, I think sometimes I take too many different kinds of pictures, landscapes and people, and, and maybe if you pick one subject and you work with it, you can learn better and fill in these gaps in your knowledge. You think sure. you, there's a little advantage Yeah, I mean, there, there's something to be said for focusing on something and yeah. learning it more, but, you know, photography should be fun, so, you know, you want to do what's fun, and if that means photographing a whole bunch of different things, then sure, why not, right, you know? Right. There's, no, there's no law that says that you have to do just one thing or you have to have a certain style or, or any of that. You can do whatever whatever's fun for you. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, but for some people, the the satisfaction is, is part of the satisfaction is learning to get better at you know doing something, something. that they love and maybe just for a week but just yeah, finding right. something that you right. just spend a lot of you know maybe even just one object and trying different things until you feel like you've actually captured it might sure. be an interesting discipline you know yeah yeah, yeah i'm sure you've taken this shot the tunnel shot many 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 times yeah and and i've and do you learn things every time i mean sure yeah. absolutely yeah. um you know part of what i learn <clears throat> excuse me part of what i learn is um, weather patterns, you know, mm -hmm. so when you're, um, you know, I think I'm lucky enough to be able to live near such an extraordinary place. No kidding. But everybody has beautiful places somewhere nearby. And if you can get to know some of those places, you can learn the weather patterns and the seasons and take advantage of those. Become an old timer. Yeah. So we've talked about light, which is a mm. key element of photography, and then composition mm. is another one. And I think one of the challenges for especially emerging photographers when they're doing landscapes is they're in this scene and it's so majestic and it's so beautiful. Mm. It's hard to isolate. Yeah, absolutely. And wh what do you want to include? What don't you include? Yeah. In? And what's a general mistake that you see photographers that are new making and, and how, how do they grow to know exactly how to isolate? Yeah, uh, great question. And and maybe one of the most difficult things to learn in photography, and, and it's not just new photographers. You know, I think, I think the most common mistake in, in that people make, not only in landscapes but in any genre, is just including too much in the frame. You know, mm. kind of having this idea that if well, if I just point the camera out there and, and show everything, then something good will come out of it, and, and it doesn't work that way. So you really have to make a you know a conscious decision to to try to find the essence of what it is you're photographing ask yourself you know what is it that caught your eye in the first place and whatever that is that's what you want to make the photograph about and get rid of everything else you know it's about that's hard with about, landscape you've got a wide angle is. lens you got yeah. a lot and you're of in stuff Yosemite where it's right. like you want everything right. well first of all <laughs> there's um, a good example has, though yeah, yeah I, some, I have some examples that i can show but um right. first of all um it's a great color i, I think that. that you know what let's take a break and when we come back let's okay. let's let's right, sure. address this yeah, no problem because that's a great subject okay yeah. it is a big problem i have my my uh landscape you want to include everything pictures don't you, all look like mush Mush? Too much stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Overdone. Hey, let's talk a little bit about audible.com. We were talking ab about Michael's great books. Now, f photography books probably aren't great on audible.com because it's all audio, but they are great if you want to listen to fiction, nonfiction, history, mysteries, thrillers, Fifty Shades of Grey. Audible has it, 100,000 titles. And you can get your first book free. All you have to do is go to Audible Podcast dot com slash twit photo audible podcast dot com slash twit photo you'll be signing up for that gold account 
That's a book a month, and your first month's free. Your first credit is free. And uh, the book is yours to keep, cancel at any time, pay nothing if you choose. You won't want to, though. I can tell you there's so many great books on audible.com. There's almost an unlimited selection of Sherlock Holmes. You like Sherlock Holmes, Brian? Are you a big... Yeah. If you're watching the uh, BBC Sherlock Holmes that just came out, or maybe the Robert Downey Jr. movies, you know, I, I feel for our kids today. They don't know the original Sherlock Holmes. By the way, this is a great use for Audible, is young adults, uh, children. They have books for every age at audible.com. And these are so well read, they're so nicely done, that it will turn a kid on to reading. Sometimes people say, oh no, I want them to read in real books. Hey, this is reading, it's a real book, every word is there. And a lot of times, kids discover books and discover literature from listening to Audible. And for those of us who uh, wish we had more time to read, there's nothing like it. When you know, you're at the gym or you're in the car driving or uh, walking the dog, I walk Ozzy, I listen to Audible books because it's a great way to get reading done. I get a couple of hours a day that I wouldn't be able to read otherwise thanks to Audible. It's kept me in the game, so to speak. A love of reading, I tell you. That's what Audible's all when about. When you're driving to Yosemite, when you're waiting for the <laughs> light to change. That is a long <laughs> drive. I got to tell you, audiblepodcast.com slash twitphoto. Get a book. There are books in there that will get you all the way to Yosemite and back. The 20, thing that's crazy hours. to me is the selection. How it just they have everything, so even yeah. niche stuff. So yeah. It's just great. Yeah. So. so here's your chance. Free book, audiblepodcast.com slash twitphoto. Somebody's saying, I wish Harry Potter was an audio book back in the day. It actually was. The great Jim Dale does an amazing job with Harry Potter. Those are Audible books, but Apple has an exclusive in the iTunes store. So I can't give you a free Harry Potter book, but that is a great way to listen to Harry Potter. And you know who did them in the UK? Stephen Fry. Those are mm. great. Yeah, see, see. But they, you know, click that link. See, click your videos. Because they have other good Harry Potter-like stuff, like The Hunger Games. The Lightning Thief is so good. Um, the Alchemist. These are great titles that are also, uh, the kids are going to love them. Audible Pot. Oh, I read the Aragon trilogy. That is an amazing, amazing trilogy. That was written by a t teenager. That guy was a teenager when I he wrote serious? this. Yeah. Wow. Audiblepodcast.com slash twitphoto. Try it right now. Right now. All right. I want some examples of how to eliminate the inessential from my landscape. Because okay. I do a lot of landscapes, as you know, Catherine. I, know. I love yeah. landscape photography. Okay. Well, I've got, I've got something on my screen here. Um, it's a photograph of, of Half Dome. Mm. And, you know, I sometimes think about how many photographs people have taken of Half Dome over the years. I mean, there must be millions. And I suspect that most of them aren't very good. Um, and part of, the, part of the reason... <laughs> You've seen my portfolio, <laughs> have you? Yes. You saw my postcards? <laughs> part, part of the reason for that is I think, you know, someone is standing there, um, you know, taking a picture of Half Dome and not thinking about everything that's in the frame. You know, they might have a wide angle lens on and, and Half Dome is just a small piece of the frame and there's all this other stuff going on. You know, there's sky, trees, you know, there might be... Uh, you know, bus going by, whatever. There, there's all this other stuff that they're not thinking about. So, you know, as I said, you want to try to f figure out what it is that caught your eye in the first place mm. and make the photograph about that, fill mm. the frame with that. And if it's half dome, then great. You know, zoom in on it and fill the frame with it. You know, here's. Now, a you're still shooting wide. You don't use it. Oh, well, I use telephoto lenses all the time. You do. In landscapes. Absolutely. And that, I think that's kind of a you know, almost a myth that, you know, wide angle yeah. or landscape equals wide angle, you know, and, and many of the world's greatest landscape photographs were made with telephoto lenses. I mean, I can think of, you know, Moon and Half Dome by Ansel, for example, is a great example. That was a 250 millimeter no. lens on, on medium format. Wow. Um, you know, wow. so, so, you know, telephotos can isolate things, which is a great thing in landscapes as well as any other type of situation. Um, you know, of course, of course, you need wide angles too, but you know, just I wouldn't restrict yourself to just using a wide angle lens right. with with right. landscapes. So, well, that's this, a good example. A that moon and half dome. It's just the moon and yeah. half dome. It's yeah. a very simple, Absolutely. stark yeah. photo. Right. Yeah. 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 And that's the power of it is yeah. the simplicity. Exactly. So, uh, you know, in this photograph, I felt that the light and the clouds were enough that I didn't didn't need anything else. So I filled up most of the frame with, with half dome. Yeah. Um, you know, you can have juxtapositions, right? So here's a half dome and a cloud, but it's still, it's very simple. It's just two things and really nothing much else going on in the frame. Uh, another juxtaposition, mm. half dome again, although it's really a, you know, almost a 
just an accent here, um, but it's half dome and the juxtaposition of the dogwood flowers and branches in the foreground. So again, it's, it's really simple. Um, I eliminated you know, whatever else I could from the frame to just make it about those two things, and, and that's really what you want to try to do. So, um, you know, here's an example of a photo that I think didn't work so well. You know, this was kind of my first attempt, and I really liked El Capitan up there in the mist, and there was this interesting ice pattern down below, um, but the two didn't work together all that well, I thought. In fact, one of the one of the big problems is that there's this horizontal line. It's like a layer know, going, cake. <laughs> I don't know if you see my mouse here yet, yeah, yeah. but there's this horizontal line going right. right through the middle of the frame, which splits it in half. So it's it's really kind of two photos stuck it looks together, like that. and that's yeah. that's one of those classic examples where, you know, I was just trying to do too much. Right. And so when you find yourself in that situation, you say, you know, I'm not sure that this is really working. Then maybe it's better to stick to one thing, you know, just El Cap or just the ice. So, so I decided um, to focus on the ice, oh, found a little that. bit different angle, and I think you know for me that works better Much as a better. photograph yeah. than the first one. So taking a picture is as much as choosing what not to take a picture of as what to Absolutely. take a picture. You know, of. if you're a painter, you're starting with a blank canvas and adding things to it. Yeah. If you're a photographer, you're starting with the whole universe an infinite universe and you're picking one that. little piece of it out and and saying here look at this I think and that's this the is magic of photography Absolutely, yeah. you're drawing somebody to look at something specific yeah, yeah. in a much larger palette yeah. they're very inspiring <laughs> I love Throwing that, that out there. I love that um, here's another example I think this works pretty well but the the dark rocks at the bottom of the frame bothered me a little bit you know I, I, I took this picture I looked at it on the back of my camera. You know, this was this was taken digitally. It's one of my my first digital pictures, really, back in the day. Uh, and I looked at it on the back of the camera, and I thought, you know, what's really catching my eye is that reflection at the top of the frame, and those kind of streams of water coming over. So I, I zoomed in more and focused just on on that. So again, I think that's simpler mm. and stronger. Um, same idea here. You know, this is this is a nice photograph of Vernal Fall. It's a Yosemite. postcard. It's right. a postcard. It's a postcard, exactly. Yep. You know, it yep. shows what it looks like. It didn't capture, to me, what, you know, kind of what it felt like mm -hmm. to stand there. And so, so I asked myself, you know, what is it that's really, uh, you know, catching my eye? What is it that I think is most interesting? And it was the, the texture of the water, the spray. So I zoomed in on just a section of that, that, which I think has a little bit more impact. So, yep. um, now these are all sort of examples of you know zooming in with a long lens. So so they're you know they're landscapes, but they're more you know abstract or details. Um, the same principle applies to you know to bigger landscapes too. If you're, I, I tend to find that I'm getting the wide-angle lens out when the light's really good. You know where the clouds are really interesting and the, the sort of the big scene ha is uh, exceptional. Um, and in those situations, though, it's still essential to simplify, to, to, to really figure out what are the most essential components of the scene that you're looking at and get rid of everything else. Pixel Smooth in our chat room says, I can actually, I look at that picture, I can hear the falls. And well, it's true. As soon as I he said so. that, I went, I yes, so. yeah. you can. Yeah. You can hear that roar. You're there. Much more dramatic than the postcard image. And yeah. is, that, is this a normal process for you? Are you walking up to these things and shooting at one where have you gotten where you're honed enough where you're not even taking that postcard shot initially? Um, well, I, I hope I'm not taking too many of the postcard <laughs> shots at this point. Um, but it, sometimes it does take some work to sort of refine and, and find the composition. Um, I don't know, you know, a lot of times I, I find that my best photos sort of compose themselves, you know, where I walk up and I go, oh, there it is, right there. And other times I'll find that you know, something catches my eye. Okay, enough with the falls. I hear them, I hear them. You don't have to put them in. <laughs> um, so something will catch my eye and it just, it just uh, doesn't work for some reason. You know, there's a branch in the way. There's something distracting in the right. background. So right. I'll try different angles, but it never quite comes together. That, that's pretty common. Sometimes that just happens. You know, no matter what, you can't find the right uh, angle. Frustrating, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I was I was uh, heartened to read uh, something that Ansel Adams wrote one time about that, and he said, and I can't quote him verbatim, but he said something about that. 
he usually, it's essentially the same thing, that he usually finds that, found that the images, his best images were things that he saw right away. Mm. And the ones that he really had to work on rarely worked out, really, rarely ended up being some of his best. So, so at least we're not alone. You know? Yeah. yeah. Well, a good company. And then what you were saying earlier mm -hmm. makes sense where you're getting less postcard type shots because you're being thoughtful from the beginning. So yeah, yeah. instead of just pulling out your camera and starting to shoot because it's wow, it's beautiful, thinking, hey, what what is making this beautiful and how, yeah. how can I evoke the feeling I'm experiencing yeah. right now? Yeah. And if film? it's your first time, you know, let's say it's your first time to Yosemite or your first time to the Grand Canyon or whatever it is, you know, by all means, take the postcard shot, you know kind of get it out of your system, right? You know, take take some of the classic views, even if the light isn't exceptional. And I think that, in a way, sort of frees you then to be a little bit more imaginative to to go beyond that once you've, you've gotten, you know, you've gotten the, the, the postcard, you've gotten the, the shot that you can take home to your friends and go here, you know, this is what the Grand Canyon looks like. And then, then you can be uh, a little bit more creative. Risky. After that. Yeah. Take some risks. We're talking with Michael Fry. He uh, is the author of the photo Photographer's Guide to Yosemite, which uh, will be out in second edition soon. You'll be able to Within get it at Yosemite. Probably, probably a couple weeks. So, yeah, um, you can. When it's out, you'll be able to order it from my website. Uh, it'll be on Amazon. MichaelFry.com um, with an yeah. E at the end. And uh, uh, this is also an iPad app, which is great. Right. If you have an I iPad or an iPad iPhone, and iPhone, you can uh, you can just put it on your phone and take it with you. Uh, also of, uh, of this book, The Digital Landscape Photography. Um, boy, just really uh, great stuff. Do you do much post-processing after you take an image? Well, sure. You know, um, sometimes more, sometimes less. It depends on, on the situation. Um, you know, some, some lighting situations are more challenging where you might have to blend exposures together. You know, if it's too contrasty for one exposure, you might have to blend more than one exposure together to get detail and highlights and shadows so those get more complicated another good reason to have a tripod yeah do, absolutely yeah. do you bracket usually when you shoot um only if it's one of those situations i was just talking you about know ahead where, of time well i i i can usually i can usually estimate but i also look at the histogram and right. and that will tell me whether i've got highlight detail and shadow right. detail and if i if i don't if I, or if i can't you know there are there are lots of situations where it most situations where if you expose a photograph properly you can get you should be able to get detail in both highlights and shadows but um, there are some situations that are just too contrasty for that where they, it exceeds the dynamic range that the camera can handle and you know those are the situations where I'll bracket in case I want to blend exposures together later I don't always need to but sometimes I, I do and so just in case I will um, and you can look at a histogram and that will tell you whether you've got shadow detail and highlight detail. And if you can't get both in one frame, then you can bracket exposures and take something lighter or darker. So if you see the, the histogram, which you could turn on in the back of all the SLRs yeah. in some point and shoot, if you see the histogram falling off before the end on the left or the right, yeah. that means you don't have any detail at the bright yeah. or the you dark. Know, um, I, I, uh, I can actually show you some examples that I brought about sure about histograms here That'd so great. and so, this is actually one of i think people's biggest they don't know how to read a histogram be very i don't Absolutely. i want to learn this is great um, um, i turn it on sometimes because at least i know if i've if i've over exposed or underexposed, i can tell that from a histogram but i'd love yeah. to know more about what yeah, i can see um, and I, and so there's the histogram in the lower left right there. so so that's a really common thing I, I know lots of photographers very experienced photographers who you know say i'm not really too <laughs> sure about what does what this the, mean what the histogram is telling you <laughs> yeah. but but you know it's a great piece of information that can really help you dial in the exposure so the one um, we're looking at is a classic bell curve all, right. all, a lot of the pictures right. the pixels in the middle and then it tapers yeah. off on the left and the and the right. reason that i'm showing this is because i i want to emphasize that it's actually not important at all uh, what the shape of the histogram is so this is that classic bell curve you're talking about um here's another photograph <laughs> with <laughs> that's not hysterical a, not a classic bell curve <laughs> no but and for those both... who are just listening there's a big spike at yeah. the uh, right end, and there's a little spike at the left yeah. end, and there's nothing in between. Right. Because it's and a very it's, it's, contrasty it's kind image. It's a two-tone image. Yeah. There, there's um, Bright water, and dark. Which, is, which is what you're seeing in the background, right. the reflection there, and then some darker areas with gulls on a pier that are silhouettes. So there's essentially you know, lots of light areas and a little bit of dark areas, and the histogram reflects that. There's a spike towards the right side, and there's a little spike towards the left side. <laughs> Um, and but both of these photographs are properly exposed. Right. You know, the the most important thing to look at 
with the histogram is not the shape, but the right edge and the left edge. That's really all that's important is the right edge and the left edge. So, you know, this one, there's nothing pushed up against the right edge of the histogram. There's nothing pushed up against the left edge of the histogram. And, and same thing here. That's what so, you want? So the, usually, yes, if you can. If you, if you can do that, and some situations are too contrasty for that, but if you can, that's what you're looking for. Um, and the situations where it is too contrasty, is that when you would do two frames Right, I would do two or more. And are you merging them traditionally, like through burning and dodging style masking techniques, or using HDR? Um, I'm using, I'll sometimes kind of do it manually in Photoshop using layers and layer masks where I, you know, take, take part the bright of, part, part of this here, the dark part, part of that here. image. Yeah. Uh, I also use uh, a plugin for Lightroom called LR Infuse. It's L R slash E N F U S E, um, and it's uh, it's donationware, so it's cheap. It works really well. It it w what I like about that is that it gives me very natural looking results. Um, you know, I, sometimes HDR. And this of course is always a matter of taste, but but sometimes for me HDR can look a little weird. And so, you know, I want something that's going to give me something that looks looks natural and, and yeah. LR every every one of your images looks absolutely natural. Yeah. Well, you would never say, "Oh, there's HDR." I hope so. Yeah, yeah. Um, so looking at looking at this histogram. So let me describe this one. This is like a camel, maybe. You've got a <laughs> yeah. on this the left, you've got a peak. You're in trouble. And then in the middle, you got a, a kind of another hump, and then it's tapering off uh, as it goes to the yeah, right. Yeah, but but there's a spike at the right edge. Yeah, that's And there's not something good. pushed up against the left edge. Yeah. So so that that's what I'm talking about is the edges. So the spike on the right edge indicates you know the right edge is highlights, the left edge is shadows. So the spike on the right edge indicates overexposed, so washed out highlights it's clipped, somewhere. It's clipped, clipped in, the, yes. in the highlights. And the left side indicates clipping in the shadows, right. black shadows with no detail in Some it. cameras will actually flash where it's clipped uh, yes. on the image. Yeah, and, and, and that's a great useful tool yeah. also that, you know, the, the highlight alert that flashes at you, you know, technically known as the blinkies, uh, where, <laughs> where it flashes at you. <laughs> I mean, that, that not only tells you that something is overexposed, but it tells you what, what? how much, right. you know. Um, so again, you know, this is a histogram with, um, you know, a, a properly exposed. So I'm not looking contrast. at the middle part. It right. doesn't matter yeah, where those peaks and valleys are. are. It's what's at the left and the right. Against the right edge, yep. and maybe a tiny bit pushed up against the left edge, but that's okay. Now, as I said, there are some situations where you can't do that. It's there's too much contrast. Like if you look at this one, we have nothing pushed up against the left edge, but there's a little spike at the right edge. I see it. And if we made it darker. It would shift everything over to the left. And then you'd have, have a problem on the left. Shadows, yeah. okay? Now this is one where the right edge looks fine. You know, it's close, but there's nothing pushed up against that right edge, but there's something pushed up against the left edge, so we have some black shadows. Now, in That may not be a bad thing. Right, may not be, exactly. Look at your composition, very good, I guess. That's a very good point. I think in landscape photographs that if you have, if you have a high contrast situation, and no matter how you expose it, you're either gonna have washed out highlights or black shadows, you'd rather have sh highlight detail and sacrifice the shadows than the other way around. I think, first of all, your eye, when you look at a photograph, most of the time your eye goes to the brightest spots. So right. if there's a washed out highlight, you're gonna notice it right away. And, and it's true, also, you always see those yeah, burned out areas. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also not something we see in real life, so it looks right. unnatural. You know, if you're walking around outside you don't see washed out highlights. There's, right. There aren't things out there that are so bright that they look washed out to you, unless you're looking right at the sun, maybe, right. um, or something really bright like that. So, um, so for those. On the reasons, other hand, we often see places we can't see into where it's just yeah, black. Shadows, yeah, shadows. Exactly. That's backlit, for example. Yeah, yeah, backlight or you know at night. Right. And we're really used to seeing black shadows, so that right. seems more acceptable to us vi uh, visually in a photograph to have black shadows. So. So most of the time, I'd rather see you know this histogram with nothing pushed up against the, the right edge, and and if there's some black shadows, okay. Right. Um, that's you know that's assuming you're trying to do it all in one frame. If if personally, if I saw this histogram like this, I would also take a lighter exposure to make sure I had both. You know, one with shadow detail, one with highlight detail, and then I could. Or, or maybe three or four, so that I could potentially blend those together later. And I would guess you never use a histogram in a vacuum. You're always looking at the image. I, I, sure, of course, yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah. Well, I think, um, and that's a actually a really tool. good point. And I think the a really. <laughs> 
important thing is do not rely on the back of your screen. Yes. That's the biggest, no, <laughs> well, you, seriously. And I'm hearing, I'm hearing Michael look a lot at the back of his screen, well, but if you know at, what you're looking, looking for. Looking, I mean, as far as exposure is concerned, yes. do yeah. not well, rely on the back that's of your screen. An important distinction. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is so unreliable. I mean, because you can change the brightness on the screen, or you, you have light reflecting off of it, or it's really dark outside, and so the screen looks bright, but it really, you know, it's really. We do the same thing in the studio all the time. We'll look at monitors and go, that looks awfully dark. And, and Ryan will always yeah. say, don't look at the monitor. It's, the, it's yeah. not reliable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the, the monitors on the back of cameras are or even worse. Generally, or... pieces of junk. Right. You know, so, so they're not a great way to evaluate what the photograph really looks like in terms of exposure. Histogram is, is much more reliable. So resist yeah. looking at it and pull up the histogram. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. and the highlight alert, the blinkies too, because that'll, blinkies, that'll technical warn term. you about overexposed highlights as well. So um, I don't know if you want to go on here. I have yeah, a couple please. More. Uh, this is great. You know, it, I would say to, to make this really simple, most of the time, and again, I'm talking about landscapes, but most of the time you want the brightest pixels to be near but not touching the right edge. So, you know, here this is underexposed because the brightest pixels are not near that right edge. There's a big gap here. Um, you know, this one is clearly overexposed. It looks washed out and there's a big spike at the right edge. This one is properly Perfect. exposed. You know, the brightest pixels are near but not touching that right edge. And it so happens that we have shadow detail too, which is great. Um, a couple, couple of exceptions to that. You know, if you actually have the sun in the frame, it's okay to have a spike at the right edge of the histogram and to have some, some parts of it blinking at you. Um, that looks normal because if you were looking at the sun in real life, it would be too bright to see any detail in. Right. So, so that's fine. I mean, I think this picture looks properly exposed, but you can see that there's a spike at the right edge of the histogram. And, and this is Lightroom's version of the blinkies, you know, where it shows, it shows you washed out highlights in red. So there's some small washed out areas here, but again, you know, I think that's fine if the sun's in the picture. It's very minimal too, yeah. as well. Um, if it's really low contrast, then you don't necessarily have to push the histogram all the way to the right either. It could be somewhere in the middle or a little bit above middle like, like this one is, um, where the histogram is really narrow as it is here. It fills up you know, maybe half the space available. And, and if you're uh, using raw mode, then you can often get away with having small overexposed areas and be able to recover those in software later. So, so there's a few exceptions, but most of the time you just want to try to push that histogram as far to the right as you can get it without all the way up without against clipping. the right edge. Exactly, without clipping. And that goes back to film. It was always exposed for the highlights. I mean, that's yeah, just... Yeah, well, yeah, and slide film especially. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. So. You can recover details sometimes from the dark better than you can from... Uh, overexposed. Well, yeah, you know, there, there's limits to, to either, either way. way. You know, right. you, you're right. You can often pull out a lot of shadow detail that's seemingly just black, but as, as Catherine mentioned, you're likely to bring out a lot of noise when you do that right. too. I mean, some right. cameras are better than that than others. So it's always good to know the characteristics of your camera and, and kind of how much you can get away with. And, you know, when I'm working with students in workshops, one of the first things I do is take one of their pictures and try to really lighten up a bunch, you know, some dark shadows and see how much noise do we get. Right. And, or, you know, find some overexposed highlights with a raw file and see if we can recover those, you know, kind of what the limits are to recover overexposed highlights. That's cool. That sounds so, like a good exercise. Yeah. You're, you shoot Canon? Yeah. And uh, uh, is a 5D? It's a 1DS Mark II. Where to go? Oh, there it is. It's over there. We moved it. No, it. no, we didn't steal it. We just moved it. Yeah. It's, it's uh, slowly being moved towards my car. <laughs> I only yeah. have the Mark II. Yeah. Mark II. Um, the, you know, Canon and Nikon are both great. I, I you know, I, I work with all kinds of cameras and workshops. And, do you ever do uh, a medium format or larger formats? You know, I, well, I used to use medium format film mm -hmm. all the time, and mm -hmm. I've, I've never uh, bitten the bullet and bought a really expensive medium they format are expensive, back. Yeah. Um, you know, the new Nikon D800 and D800. That's almost D medium format, isn't are, it? Yeah. Are pretty tempting. Yeah. Yeah. If you had the money, is it worth the investment to go to, to the medium format route? You know, even, with, even something like the, like the, the Nikon D800, right? It's 36 megapixels. Um, I think for most photographers, it's overkill. Right. You know, unless you make large prints, you'll never notice the difference. You and know, large, for, like really large. <laughs> like yeah, billboard you know, size. At least, exactly. At least 16 by 20. Right. You know, you can right. you can maybe tell the difference in, at that size, but uh, you know, between a 12 megapixel camera and a 36 megapixel camera at a 16 by 20 print. 
um, if you know if it's done properly and you know and everything else is you know using sharp lenses and the camera's on a tripod and all of that. Um, a lot of people probably couldn't tell that much of a difference, even at that size. Do you have a favorite 95%. lens that you, you like to use? Well, I probably use my, my 70 to 200 zoom more than anything else. Um, See, this blows my mind. Killing the myth. Yeah. Just yeah. killing the myth. I thought yeah. it, you had to have a 24 for uh, Yeah, I, I have a 70 to 200 and a 17 to 40, and I probably use the 70 to 200 you know, 90% of the time. Is that interesting? Yeah. But. My, if, if I look at my best photos, I would say you know half of them are taken with a wide lens. Mm -hmm. So you know I bring out the wide-angle lens when the light and clouds and weather and all that is really good and really interesting, and so those are bound to be some some of the better ah, photographs. So that's when you want to get more in there. Yeah, that, you want to yeah, get that scenery. Me, that's, that's, yeah, that's when I'm, I'm that doing weather. That. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So. Makes me want to go to Yosemite right now. We have yeah, a dive. <laughs> it, it, it's hot right now. Do you do maybe, workshops maybe. there? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I, if I, people I, are planning a trip to Yosemite, mm -hmm. they should uh, go to your website, michaelfryfryee.com. Yeah. yeah, and they can find out about my workshops there. Where, uh, Boy, that'd I, be, that's almost worth making a trip to Yosemite just for that. Sure. What a great right. opportunity. Yeah, and, many, and many people do. Yeah. Um, I do workshops uh, with the Ansel Adams Gallery, mostly I do a couple of my own, but uh, full moon the... photography workshop, July thirty first. Mm -hmm. yeah, Let's come, do it. Up. Nothing like the full moon. Yeah, yeah. How do, so some, some tips for shooting the full moon? That's a tough one. Uh, it is a tough one, um, and 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 I have I could probably find it here on my my uh, my screen or somewhere, but I have on my blog somewhere I have some some tips about that about night photography and about photographing lunar rainbows. That's a popular thing that Ooh. people do. You ever see a double in, rainbow? In, uh, no, yes. I'm just teasing, <laughs> I'm just teasing, just teasing you. <laughs> you. You couldn't resist. Right? Yeah. Well, I mean that's where that's from, right? You know, I know. It's from just Yosemite. Outside, just outside yeah. Yosemite. Yeah. Yeah. Look yeah. at that. So wow. is this a, is this one of the things you're doing to stay inspired? Because I imagine mm. you're you're in the space that's gorgeous. How do you not look at that? Lose now these are lights, obviously. Is this exploring. Yeah. Um, well, you know, they're showing on the screen questions. some of my some of my nighttime photographs. So, you know, I've I've tried to photograph the landscape in all kinds of different ways. You know, just classic daytime landscapes, which you've seen, as well as some of my my nighttime work, which is is kind of wild, like that one, yeah. um, where I'm using uh, various you know light lighting equipment, mostly flash, but sometimes flashlights to to light things and and create all kinds of wild colors and things like that. So, I mean, that's something that we'll be doing in that, that workshop that you mentioned is doing light painting, you know, learning Fun. how to, learning how to well, do that. Let me go back to that, uh, the, the petroglyphs. So this is obviously a, a, a timed exposure, a mm -hmm. long exposure, because mm -hmm. you can see the star movement. Are you then re uh, flashing a, a, a flash to get the petroglyph? Is that right, how? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the basics of it, yeah. It's, it's actually uh, probably a couple of, this was done on film, uh, this image was maybe about 15 years old. All the more impressive. You only get <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but it's a it's a multiple exposure. Um, so so you know cameras locked on the tripod. But I I did a couple of exposures for the flash on the rock, and then I focused on infinity and then and opened up the nice. shutter for another you know hour and a half for the star. Hour track. and a half. Wow. Oh, geez. Yeah. What fun. What fun. This is also great. Yeah, I mean that that's really fun. I think one of the one of the the great things about knife photography in in combination with the landscape is that uh it allows you to be really creative. Mm -hmm. You know, you can you can overpower the light because there's so little of it by adding your own. So that adds that element where you can light different objects in the landscape and kind of direct people's eye or use gel filters over the light source to create different colors. You can um you can create movement. You know, star trails are an example of that, or you know, moonlit clouds. You, know, you don't think of, of clouds as being something you can blur, but if you're doing an eight-minute exposure at night, they can blur and create streaks and, and all kinds of things like that. So, so it's it can be really fun and creative. It's not, um, you know, it's not for beginners. I don't think it 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 does take a little bit of technical proficiency, or at least you know, understanding some of the basics, but. Um, but digital photography makes it so much easier, and I find that you know, teaching workshops on night photography, people really get into it and, and can, can learn a lot really in a short fun. period of time.
really fun. And if there was a beginner that wanted to just experiment and try, what's a sort of simple entry point shot that they could go out and try to do? Yeah, I would try, I would try something lit by the full moon. You know, um, could be, you know, a mountain or just any scene, maybe an ocean, um, any scene that's lit by the full moon. And, uh, you know, the, probably the most difficult, one of the most difficult things is to actually focus at night, right? Because your autofocus probably won't work, it's too dim. Um, and so, basically what I tell people is, is usually you want to compose a scene where everything's distant. You know, you don't want to be trying to have something five feet in front of the camera and get that in focus as well as, you know, mountain in the distance. You want, you want to pick a composition where everything is reasonably far away. And, and then you essentially want to focus at infinity, but most lenses these days focus past infinity, right? So you can't just dial in the lens to infinity and say, oh, I'm good. Right. You actually have to <laughs> focus it. So pick a bright light source. You know, if, there, if you can actually see the moon, just focus on the moon, either on autofocus or manually, and then put it on manual focus so you don't Refocus. tweak it. You can even Man. tape the lens, right, yeah. so, that you, so that it doesn't move and just keep that focus point. So that's one of the first things, is, is getting the focus right. That's where I use that, putting that focus button on the back is right. very helpful. Yeah. Because then I don't accidentally hit the yes. refocus. Yes, yes. Yeah. That, that is real helpful. Yeah. Um, do you do that? Yes, yeah. I do. Yeah, we're, um, we're working on Catherine. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a slow learner here. <laughs> and, and then... You just gotta steal about, my camera, Leo. And just I will, I'll set it. it for you. <laughs> it's about getting the exposure right, you know, so... Um, and, you know, usually, um, God, I can't even remember off the top of my this head This is now. a perfect I'm example. Thinking, I mean, what a difficult exposure. Yeah, th Holy that, wasn't, that wasn't too bad. And this is actually a daytime photo. So this is, this, is, this is one of those little myths about, you know, moon photos. Most of the photos that you see, probably all, of like a moonrise or a moonset, moon above the landscape, are taken at sunrise or sunset, oh, not during the middle of the night, because in the middle of the night, the contrast is too great. The right. moon is so much brighter than the landscape that you're either going to have a washed out moon right. or the moon's properly exposed and the landscape's Ooh. completely black. So Gosh, I love that shot. So you need to, you know, so, so moon and half dome, I mean, that's a great example. We talked uh -huh. about that before. Ansel that was Adams daytime? Photograph. It was sunset. <laughs> um, and, you know, his Moonrise Hernandez photograph is the most famous one. Again, that's another sunset photograph. That makes sense, though. Once you yeah. say it, of course, it's not right. nighttime. Yeah. 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 It conveys Just, nighttime, but it isn't nighttime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the moon, I mean, the moon is a great addition to those kinds of scenes. Oh, yeah. it, it, it helps to create that kind of a mood. I, I'm not sure what it is. Mystery, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. With a shot like this, is there a particular shutter speed that you like to settle on, or is it just depending on the... You know, usually... Um, if if nothing's moving and here you know the water might be moving a little bit but but not enough to be a concern, then then aperture f stop is my first consideration. So I I, I want to pick an aperture that's going to give me enough depth of field to get everything in focus. Usually in landscape photographs you want everything to be in focus. So you're talking f11, 16, how? Yeah, you know f11, f16, even f22. Um, you know, here there's not that much depth, so I, I wouldn't need a real small aperture. Mm -hmm. um, and then whatever shutter speed is going to give me the right exposure at that aperture. And, um, you know, I do most of my exposures manually, but um, if you're using aperture priority, then, you know, you can, you can do that. How do you do your exposures manually? Are you using a light meter? I mean, you can't put a meter on the moon. No, um, you know, I'm using, uh, I'm just using, these days, mostly the camera's built in. Meter. The meter. And and I'm using the histogram, you know. So the so the meter is a starting place, right? And then I look, at the, look at the histogram and adjust if necessary. And if you have, which many cameras do these days, if you have, uh, if you can see a histogram in live view, that is is that's right. really nice that's because right. you can just dial in the exposure in advance. You Perfect. Know, you, you can adjust and trust that not your eyes, not uh, the meter yes, even, exactly. but trust yeah. the histogram. Yeah. Hammer, yes. hammer that point in. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I th I think honestly, I think light meters are outdated technology you know I mean we've been using them forever photographers have been using them forever and they're really pretty crude instruments compared you know, to a, a histogram, histogram is right. much more accurate yeah. and and I'm sure you know I'm sure if they put their mind to it the camera manufacturers can come up with something even better I don't know uh, but uh, but yeah, histogram I think is a much more I'm turning on my blinkies and my it gives a lot more information yes yeah, yeah. yeah. Michael, it's such a pleasure uh, meeting yeah, you. Thank, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Well, I appreciate all your hard very work welcome. and welcome. It's, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. You want to go to Yosemite. When you do, make sure you get the Photographer's Guide to Yosemite, either on your iPad or your iPhone or the 
or the uh, printed edition available from YosemiteConservancy.org or Michael's website, MichaelFry.com. That's where you'll also find the uh, Digital Landscape Photography Guide and his other books, MichaelFry.com. And the workshops and the full moon workshop at the end of the month. Wow, that would be fun. Yeah, it was. So nice to meet you. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank nice you so much. It's a pleasure. We, did we have one more Twit photo yes, next we week. Do. It makes me so sad. We and guess what this we're show. doing? What are we doing? The movie poster. We got the guys back the guys, from Eleven Days uh, coming back, and good. they're going to be showing us. Because I've been us, waiting to see our, our, show our poster, poster looks. So uh -huh. we'll, we'll we'll do it up next week. Good, and then the good news is Catherine's going to keep doing Twit Photo uh, on her own site. It's going to be a new name, which I love. Photography Unfiltered. Photography dash unfiltered dot com, and uh, Catherine and Ryan Marsh will be doing that, and I'm very excited. And we're yeah. going to help you any way we can with gear or whatever. You just let Thank me know. Thank you. Thank I'm you. I'm really thrilled that you're going to Thanks do that. for giving me the I knowledge want you to even to get that. to this place. I want you to do that. So. And I know the, I know the fans do. Oh, and they, I just want to say thank you so much to the community. If it wasn't, they're, oh, they're the they reason you, I'm Catherine. doing it. That's, that's it. Yeah. So. Yeah, do it for them. Well done. So next week, uh, our last Twit photo from this studio. But it'll be back in another studio. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Michael Fry. Thank you, Catherine Hall. And uh, we'll see you next time. Uh, it'll be Tuesday, around about 1.30 p.m., 4.30 Eastern, 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern, 20.30 UTC on twit.tv. Stay tuned. Before You Buy is coming up uh, next. We've got oh, some good reviews. Oh, is it coming up? Yeah, 3 oh, o'clock Pacific, just a few minutes. That's great. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Michael. Thanks Thank for you. joining us. We'll Thank see you, you see next time. See you next week. Bye-bye. I can say that one more time. One more time. <laughs> no, you can say it. <laughs>